I invite you now to listen for the Word of God. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given according to the measure of Christ's gift, Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to start with a little bit of a history lesson. There is a confession in the Presbyterian Book of Confessions, which is our collection of statements of faith, which are meaningful to us as Presbyterians over the whole history of Of the Christian Church. So, this collection is called the Book of Confessions, and in there is a confession called the Theological Declaration of Barman. I know you've all read it before and keep it by your bedside at night, so I don't need to refresh you, but I will. The Theological Declaration of Barman was written in the city of Barman, Germany, and it was written in 1934. What was going on in Germany in the 1930s? Hmm. Yeah, may have been the Nazis. What happened was this. Germany, in a tremendous economic depression following World War I, had sunk low. And so the Nazis had begun to take power with their rhetoric. And the church, the German church, had grown incredibly weak over this period. To the point where they had a lot of anxiety. They had a weak theological core. And when the Nazis came along many of the German churches just capitulated and started to preach whatever the Nazis wanted them to preach. That doesn't seem like a good idea. And it wasn't. It was a terrible idea. And so some of the still devout and faithful Christians in Germany gathered together in Barmen to decide what they would do about the church's capitulation to this political regime which had taken over their country. And so they wrote this theological declaration. And the declaration at its core affirms a key thing, that for the church, we have only one boss. Who might that be? Jesus, right? If you said the president, that's wrong. It's Jesus. And so the reason I chose this passage from Ephesians is because in the section that we're going to read during our affirmation of faith just here in a few minutes, the writers cite specifically these words from Ephesians 4. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. It was a reminder that we as the church owe our fidelity only to Jesus Christ, but that that fidelity should look a certain way. And for this, 
For this, for what it should look like, I go back to the beginning of this chapter from Ephesians. The author's writing about unity, about the spirit of unity, and what brings about unity. Now, I know, again, in our country today, we're all very unified, we all think the same way, and we all get along very well, but indulge me, because this might help you. There are three aspects of his conversation that I want to focus on specifically, and they are these. Humility, gentleness, and patience. He lays those out first as the markers and habits through which the Christ follows Jesus and thereby reflects its unity. Humility. Humility. The church should be a place where people are heard. Do you feel heard in the world these days? Many of our neighbors do not. They do not feel heard. They feel angry. They feel frustrated. They feel as though their concerns are completely ignored. They do not feel heard. When we practice humility in the church, and it's not just the letter from the Ephesians that talks about it, Jesus himself names humility as one of the most important things we can do as disciples. When we practice humility, we set aside our own desire to be right all the time and to be heard all the time in order that we may listen to those around us. The first act of humility is to listen. I remember hearing a story about a young woman who grew up in the church and then left it. And when she went to Sunday school every Sunday, she would have all these questions after the lesson. And she would keep asking questions in Sunday school. And then finally, the Sunday school teacher turned to her and said in a very sweet Sunday school way, I'm sure, you ask too many questions, dear. The church should never say that. When you come to the church, you should be heard. The church should be gentle. The church should be gentle. It should be a place where people know they will have a soft landing spot. Life is hard. Many, many people struggle day in and day out with all sorts of things. Loneliness, sadness, sorrow, health problems, anxieties, fears over their jobs, broken relationships, regrets, despair. People suffer these things all the time, every day, and they should know that when they walk into these doors, the church will be a gentle place for them. It will be a soft landing spot. I can give you an example. When I lived in Lincoln and I was the pastor of the church there, one of our members, Ruth, she and her husband had been married over 60 years. They had no children, and Ruth's husband got sick, and then he died. And so I was having lunch with Ruth, as I did fairly regularly in the early months after her husband's death, and it had been about six months, and she told me this. She said, I really love coming to church. And the reason it means so much to me, and it's not like she hadn't been before. She was there every Sunday for her entire life. She said, the reason that it means so much to me is it is the only time all week when I am hugged. It's the only time all week that anybody touches me. And when Ruth would come to church, after church, her friends would go up and give her a hug or a gentle rub on the shoulder, or people would take her arm and walk her into the room where refreshments were served after worship. Church was gentle to Ruth in a way that no one else and nobody else could be. The church should be a soft landing place for people who are having a hard time. And then, 
patience. Patience. I haven't done any research on it, but we have to be the most rushed civilization that has ever sat on the face of the earth. We are in a hurry all the time. Patience is one of my worst spiritual disciplines. When I am driving a car, I have no concept of how to pace myself. I have to get there as quickly as possible. We live in a society where we want things now. Church needs to be the place to slow us down, to not rush to judgment, to not be quick to anger, to not be in such a hurry all the time. I don't know if you know this, but the church has been around for almost 2,000 years. This congregation, this congregation was chartered in 1850. Some of you were there. It was chartered in 1850. This, this building in which we worship, this, this building in which we worship right now was built in the 1890s. We're not really going anywhere. We don't have to be in such a hurry. In fact, our job as a church is to wait we are supposed to wait and do our work and follow Jesus until he comes back. The church should be a place which slows us down in the midst of a world which always wants to make us hurry even more. So, Humility, gentleness, patience. Not the most masculine sort of things, are they? You might ask yourselves, well, Phil, how would those have ever made a difference in 1930s Germany? How would that have ever made a difference when the National Socialists, the Nazis, were barging into the church? Should we have just said, slow down, let me give you a hug? Would that have worked? It might not have. But this, this is what I believe. If the church had been doing those things all the way along, we would never have seen the Nazis. We would never have seen them if the church had been the church all the way along. If those people in those times who had been so angry, had known that there was a place where they could go and be heard, really heard. If those people who had been so, so violent and so upset by the violence of previous wars had known there was a place where they could go and truly experience love and peace and grace. If those people who were always rushing to figure out what was going to happen next, who always felt so anxious, had known that there was a place where they could go and slow down. It would have made a difference. The ultimate difference, I don't know. But I do know this, if the church had been doing those things, there would never have been a need to write the theological declaration of Barman. On 4th of July weekend, we think about our country. And we all love our country. Everybody here loves our country. Every one of us would not trade it for any other country in the world. We can think about how great it is, how blessed we are to be here, and we can think about what it means to us. But let me tell you this. The best way to love our country and to love America is to love all the people in our country. That is what Jesus asks us to do. That is our boss. Amen.